Welcome to How to Argue Against Socialism and Defend Capitalism. I'm Aaron Clary. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, the purpose for this presentation is that the U.S. is uh, suffering a wave of socialism. This is not hyperbole or rhetoric. It's the truth, as you'll see once I prove it to you. Understand, usually, most of us capitalists, conservatives, Republican, have kind of a shame about, there's a stigma attached with being a capitalist that there's something wrong, that you're greedy, that, 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 that you're, you're a little unclean. And you could not be further from the truth because if you look at history, you will find out of everything in humankind, human history, the single best thing to happen to humankind has been capitalism. When capitalism is implemented, two things happen, two things. One, poverty tends to get wiped out or severely lessened. Two, standards of living increase. And not just increase, but increase for the masses. Right? So if you look at what capitalism has done and you familiarize yourself with the history of capitalism, you're going to find that it is very moral and noble what you're arguing. It just happens to be uh, mutually beneficial, where if you're willing to work hard, you're willing to be entrepreneurial and willing to, to uh, uh, take a risk or invest or just work plain work, uh, it's also going to benefit you as well as the masses. <laughs> Also, capitalism is freedom. Uh, I love it how the left always argues for social issues like abortion or uh, gay rights. And, and I'm more of a libertarian, so I'm, I'm kind of pro in those categories. Uh, but the, the larger point is those are quite irrelevant if you are a slave to the government. Uh, economic freedom is the primary and key freedom by which all other freedoms are guaranteed. And if you don't have economic freedom, well, good. You, you can have gay marriage, but you're still starving. You can go have an abortion, but uh, you, you don't have any money to afford a car, and your standards of living are very poor. All right? Also with capitalism is it frees up men. It frees up humankind. You are now allowed to keep the vast majority of your labor. In the past, you only attained labor either through conquest, through uh, stealing, taking over other countries, other fiefdoms, so forth and so on. Capitalism, guaranteed by law, property rights, so forth and so on, allows people to keep the vast majority of the fruits of their labor. And when you have this incentive, two things happen. One, people work harder because they're in control of their own destiny. Two, innovation is unleashed. And you mobilize the masses to produce wealth, not just for themselves, but you know, if the government needs to tax it, they can go and provide public goods. They have the financing and the production by which to tax. Right? Now, one thing I want to point out here, and you see this. You see this mobilization of labor. It's a very interesting two pictures I have. North Korean streets versus the United States rush hour. This is St. Paul, Highway 94, going towards White Bear Avenue. This is what we tolerate every day. Why? Because we willingly go to work to improve our lives. Right? Here is North Korea, their streets. Notice there are you know, fine buildings, fine roads, there are no cars. And the reason why is that these masses here in North Korea have not been mobilized or incentive to go and work like we do every day. And if you think about over time which country is going to produce more in terms of wealth, innovation, creation, technology, standards of living, it's obvious that this mobilized force, this veritable army of labor, is going to produce way more than the hermit kingdom. Right? So the larger point is, is how can't you argue for capitalism? It is moral, it is noble, it is just, it is also arguably the largest force for good throughout the history of mankind. So when you argue for capitalism, or you're arguing against socialism, you should have pride and confidence when you do, do so. It shouldn't be, well, um, I, I kind of like money. Yeah, I love money. I love, I love, oh, stick it in my ears and run around. I could bathe in money. But I also realize that it's also for the larger good when you implement a capitalist economic system. Now, capitalism as a law, not an ideology. You look at capitalism, socialism, kind of these are ideologies. But if you really think about it, capitalism is not an ideology. It is a law. It is reality. Socialism is an ideal. Capitalism is real. And what you see it is when you go and implement policy. If you look, think about logically, if you have a government and its policies are based in reality, they are going to be much more effective, produce more results, than policies that are not based in reality. And if you make the simple assumption that if you let people keep the vast majority of their wealth, they're going to produce more and take care of themselves, 
and you impl you know, the policy is governed around that and implemented based on that premise, your policies are going to be more effective. If you say, well, flowers and unicorns and Obama and free chocolates for everyone, and maybe, gee, I hope people work even though they're taxed 50%, it's not going to happen. Another perfect example. The vast majority of people who major in worthless degrees, like sociology, philosophy, women's studies, anthropology, are invariably of the leftist stripe. They cannot connect. They are ideal. They think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to major in philosophy and help children and teach them how to philosophize or whatever. It makes no sense. So when they graduate with $25,000, $30,000 in debt and they can't find a job, boom, that is reality hitting their idealism. Another one, arguing with leftists. How many of you find it frustrating? Right, okay? You, if you, can, you can show them the charts and the data, and I have, and I will, and you can show this later on to a, li a liberal, and they'll dismiss it even though right there in black and white, there's the chart, there's the data, whatever. It's frustrating, and what you ram into is the reason why it's frustrating, is because they don't live in reality. They live in an ideal. So what we gotta do is we gotta find the empirical evidence that supports capitalism, and that is based in economics, uh, which we'll go to right here. Now this is not all the empirical evidence, we're gonna delve a little bit more deeply, but just to give you some samples. First, sheer economic power of the United States. We have 5% of the population. Today we account for one-fifth of the world's GDP. So this little sliver of the population of the world accounts for five times its proportionate weight in economic production. It results from 1790 to today, this dramatic skyrocketing increase in standards of living. Right? This was not brought about by philosophy majors or journalism majors or peace study majors. This was brought on by advances in technology, industrialists, uh, technologists, all of who were incentive by what? Care, compassion? No, they could make oogles of money, stick it in their ears and run around and jump off of cliffs and into water. That's what they could do. It was freedom that drove them to their own self and betterment. Right? Here, communist China. Got news for you folks. China isn't communist anymore. They're just, just communist in name. The communist party is in control, but they are severely capitalist. Communism was about, not abolished, but done away with or ushered out under Deng Xiaoping starting in 1978. All right? Under communism, based on the data that we had converted in 1949, but this is the longest data that we have, GDP growth averaged 3.65% per year. And even I question that figure. Here, from the same data source, under capitalism, it's more than double. And you compound that over the years, the increase in standards of living is massively different. Another thing you like to do is you want to compare countries of similar regions and people to one another. It's kind of unfair to compare Norway to South Africa. Too many different cultural differences, climatic, things like that. However, the Cayman Islands and Bermuda are very similar to Cuba. They're islands in the Caribbean. They are also tax havens. They have no corporate or income tax. And if you look at their standards of living, it absolutely dwarfs the socialist utopia known as Cuba. Okay? So again, you see similar countries, but higher standards of living. The key difference between them and Cuba, they implemented capitalism to a much more extreme extent than the United States has. Cuba, pretty much a totalitarian communist dictatorship. Ireland. The Irish finally got lucky when they realized, hey, maybe we should cut social spending and lower our taxes. Beforehand, they were the armpit of Europe with roughly 65% of the standard of living of your average European country. Over time, income per capita, G I'm sorry, GDP per capita has skyrocketed to almost 140%, the European average. How did they achieve that? They lowered their corporate taxes. So it was lower than any other European country so that when US and other countries wanted to go and invest in Europe, guess where they set up their headquarters? Not France. They went to Ireland, much cheaper. East versus West Germany. If you look, here is based, the focus on the pink, because this is right before um, they switched over in, in reunification with West Germany. But average wages as a percentage of Western Germany, a quarter, productivity, 40%, GDP per, dish, uh, per person, uh, about 25%, tax revenue per person, a mere fraction of Western Germany. What's the key difference between East and West Germany back in that day? One was a capitalist or semi-capitalist nation. The other was a full-born, uh, a full uh, communist nation. And then here, we'll talk about this later, but hot water. About 55% of the people had hot water in East Germany. Telephones, less than one in five people had a telephone, okay? 
Again, you want to talk about micro, dishwasher. No one had dishwashers. You want to talk about the morality of capitalism? Here it is. Uh, this is not equal. This is poverty for all. It's equal. Everyone's equally poor, uh, but West Germany had much higher standards of living. The uh, <coughs> best comparison ever, though, is North versus South Korea. You want to see two extremely different uh, uh, economic systems implemented. Here it is. This is in 2002. I'm sure it's updated now. South Korea, about 20 grand in GDP per person. North Korea, 1,000. Uh, that's, that's even worse than most of your, stand, your, your poor African countries. Now, to show you how simple the socialist ideology is or how flawed it is, consider this back in the fifth grade. When I was in the fifth grade, I think it was my social, social studies teacher, said, okay, what would happen in a communist country where everyone makes the same amount? Okay. Or what would happen, you were paid the same amount whether you worked or not. In the fifth grade, over 25 years ago, that made sense to me. I said, well, yeah, why would you work? I wouldn't work, I'd play video games all day. That's what I would do. If I didn't have to work, and what, I'm gonna be paid the same whether I'm a janitor or a doctor? Well, I'm gonna become a janitor. Why would I go to school for eight years? Doesn't make sense to me. All right. Now, to this day, 25, however old you are, maybe 20 years later, no socialist has been able to explain this away. No one has been able to refute the simple fifth grade logic. The simple fifth grade logic that I can understand when I'm 12, I think, when you're in the fifth grade. No socialist has been able to explain why it would work otherwise. Same thing here, fifth grade logic. Okay, we have a nation of 300 million people. Which is better? Which is gonna work better? Having 300 million people individually make their own economic decisions because they're finally aware and very intricately aware of their own personal financial situation or having a bureaucrat or a bureau or 600 people with a cabinet and 535 in Congress decide for everybody which one's going to be more efficient. Again, socialists cannot get past the simple fifth grade logic. Now, microcosmic example, but still again you see the flaw in not the logic, but almost the complete refusal to adhere to logic. Gun control. If we ban guns, only criminals will have them. True? Yes, it's true. If you ban guns, you're a criminal if you have one, okay? So the good guys don't have guns, or at least the law-abiding citizens don't have guns. You tell this to a leftist who is a gun control freak, they're gonna <laughs> right over it. It's gonna sail right over them. You say, no, no, the bad, only the bad guys are gonna have guns. It, bad guys are gonna have guns regardless, just like drugs. We tried to outlaw drugs. Guess what? People still have them. Hmm, underground economy, that's how it works. Same thing with guns. Only the bad guys are going to have the guns. Well, yeah, but we got to think of the children, a complete non sequitur to the point that you were trying to make. They cannot get over this simple statement. Thinking versus feeling versus knowing. Leftists feel. Social, socialism, leftism, it's an ideal. It's very emotionally based. They want to do good, but they're too darn lazy to actually think about how do we achieve good. Africa is a perfect example. I think the last is like 1.2 trillion, maybe 1.5, the, the, the you know, whatever estimates you want to use. A lot of money has been spent on Africa. Has it improved? No, it's still pretty much a, a whole. We have got to make it known what will work, what economic system will work. Leftists say, I want to do good, and they say I want to do good, and then they go and recycle and drive a Prius, and that's about it. They don't actually find out whether or not their policies result in good. We must know. We cannot afford to feel. We have to know the empirical data that supports capitalism. We have to know the logical and moral purpose of, of having capitalism. We cannot become, uh, I don't know if you listen to Sean Hannity, the housewives, the trophy wives called, oh, you're a great American, Sean Hannity. You're a great American, too. I just, I, my husband told me to listen. It. No, out, out, out. Get off the team. You're the last one we pick when we pick for kickball. You are gone. You're not helping. You need to know why. You need to be able to debate on your own, argue on your own, have the data and the statistics ready, not just, hey, you're a great American, Sean Hannity. It can't, will not work. Will not, you'll get eaten alive, right? So, argumentative tactics. Most of, if not all of, the pro-freedom capitalist argument tactics is founded in one thing, and that is truth. If you argue the truth, you cannot lose an argument. I have never lost an argument. The reason why is I don't argue something that I don't know to be true. If I don't know it, I don't know. Could be, one way or the other, all right? So again, we have to know the empirical evidence, philosophy, morality, statistics, and so forth, and so on. But 
we have to know two other things. One, where to get this data and quickly. You're gonna have maybe a five minute window to argue and convince someone otherwise, okay? If you got to spend two hours in the library, it ain't gonna work. Two, you must know your enemy, and that's what we're gonna focus on here. One, know your enemy. Leftist psychology. This is where the vast majority of your problems are going to lie. Most of them are emotional. They are too intellectually lazy to go and find out what is going to happen, let alone go to databases, pull up research, and look at charts and data. All right? But above all else, what they lack is what's called intellectual honesty. That if you are engaging with someone uh, in a conversation, that they are intellectually honest with you. All right? Socialism is a religion. Okay? Understand a religion is a belief. You have no proof. There's no actual photographic evidence of Jesus rising from the grave. Dennis Prager, I'm sure most of you know who he is, studied to be a rabbi. He says there is no proof. There is belief. That's what a religion is. Okay? And socialism is the same thing. They have no proof. It's a belief. Well, if we just do this, then birds will chirp, and Barney Fife and uh, Andy Griffiths will come through and have a cup of coffee at the, at the coffee store. All right. Now, the other thing to point out, or two more things to point out about the religion, is also the religion hypocrisy. The can't link. Typically, the people to slam on Christians or people of a religion are leftists. How stupid of you to believe in that religion. Oh, Christians are so naive. Do you really think that dinosaurs existed, Sarah Palin, like a thousand years ago? Can we? Uh, and fine, that, that may be all great. But in the exact same breath, they will argue for a religion of socialism where they have just as little proof as any other religion. In other words, socialism is a religion, Christianity is living a religion. They have no problem ripping on Christianity or Judaism or Islam or whatever else. But boy, will they believe socialism with just as weak evidence and, and doctrine and so forth. The key thing is to understand that you're arguing against fundamentalists, not, you know, like, well, okay, we understand to let other people have their religious beliefs and their own ideological beliefs. These people are fundamentalists. And no matter what empirical data you throw at them, they're not going to believe it. The first thing you must understand about fundamentalism is the ideal comes first. Reality must then fit into that ideal. For example, arguing with an Islamic terrorist, are you going to convince that person? Who's that fundamental to, to maybe consider anything like that? Probably not. Not at all. Right? It's the same thing with leftists. You must realize that you're dealing with fundamentalists and that reality bends to the religion, not the religion that says, oh, hmm, maybe we should consider what kind of uh, uh, empirical evidence is out there that does or does not support it. Another thing, Socialism Inc. It is a business that they are in. The vast majority of people on the left side, uh, leftist side of the ideology spectrum major in worthless degrees. The reason why is they're lazy. They don't like math. I've written a post about it. You can criticize me later, but that's just the truth. They don't like calculus. It takes effort. It takes time. So they want to major in fluff. That's fun. Well, who's going to hire you? No one except the government or education or nonprofit because no one in the private sector demands your services. Okay? Now, how do you get employment then if you've majored in sociology, philosophy, or whatever else? You've got to go and have some entity take money away from people forcibly to create a job. Ergo, why the majority of your employers are public sector, government, education, so forth and so on, or nonprofits. Okay? The other thing that they don't realize is this, the parasite host relationship. Capitalists can exist, they would thrive without socialists. We don't need them. Socialists need capitalists. The reason why are the capitalists are the working class. They're the only ones producing anything of worth and value. They're the ones that generate the tax base by which it is taxed to go and fund these worthless programs and these worthless uh, careers and jobs. Right? So you have this hypocrisy here where leftists, they hate capitalism, but without it they wouldn't survive because the funds would not be there. Another example here, the walk ambassadors. Okay? Have, this is on my blog, right, but it was on Joe Souchere and all that other stuff. The city of Minneapolis, apparently the citizens of Minneapolis are complete morons. They don't know how to walk. So they have a program where they hire four walk ambassadors. I recently found out there is a walk master <laughs> to teach people how to bike and walk in the Twin Cities. You can request an ambassador for a meeting or a demonstration. Here's a demonstration. There. 
register for classes about biking or walking. Okay, this, if there is ever an example of Socialism Inc., this is it. Only a worthless, unemployable moron that has connections at the city is going to get this job. Say what they say. Um, if it paid a dollar, it would be too much. <laughs> Here's another one. This is um, uh, out in San Francisco. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. Because we have a new president, hope for a better America. Because we need change like never before on everything from the economy to climate change and more. And because we know that challenges we face from ending our dependence on oil to winning the battle for equal rights are huge. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. A leftist outfit. This gets uh, grant, not grant money. Bailout money. Or not bailout money. Stimulus money. It's in part financed by the federal government. I'd love to see, this is basically communism right here. Government financed communist job to go and promote communism. No other way around it, all right? I love to see, and I will shut up immediately, I'll take this off the presentation, when you find me the pro-capitalist jobs that are created with that one. All right, common tactics of the left. This is what you're gonna run into with leftist psychology, and this is just what experience has told me. One, they're always gonna change the topic. The second they sense that they're about to lose a debate, they will switch gears and, oh yeah, well, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan kicked puppies and babies. 1986, it's, we were talking about corporate tax policy a second ago. They will always change the topic. Don't let them change the topic, resolve one issue at a time. Two, one person's behavior reflects an entire ideology. Russia was addicted to Oxycontin, Sanford had an affair, John Edwards cheated on, oh, he's a, I'm sorry, he's a Democrat. Oh. <laughs> But therefore, because Rush did this and, and uh, Governor Sanford had an affair, all males in the conservative party uh, cheat on their wives and do dope. All right, has nothing to do, it's a name. Point that out to them. Is, you're talking about individual behaviors. It has nothing to do with the ideology. And I know that seems childish and stupid, but these are the arguments you're gonna run into. Blame the boogeyman. Leftists have very simple minds. They like to blame huge problems on one person or a small group of people. George Bush is to blame for Katrina, the economy, war, my indigestion I had two weeks ago. Even though he's not president now, he's still to blame for it. Uh, because it makes it simple. Oh, here's a, here's a villain. We can punish this individual, this group of people. Uh, a perfect example is the housing market where people say, well, who do you blame for the housing? Oh, Bush. It's Bush and Greenspan. Bush and Greenspan. No, here's really who's to blame for the housing market. And the reason this is where who's really to blame for the housing market is because I've decided this is the, the, uh, how we're going to spread the blame around. Here's the government. I'll blame them 3%. The rest of it is American society. Idiotic Americans who are so stupid they didn't know how to do a simple budget. And evil, corrupt, moralist bankers and so, uh, investment bankers in the industry that had no problem lending people more money than they were, that they could ever hopefully pay back. Try to explain that, though, to a leftist, that, hey, society goofed up this one. This has nothing to do, no, nope, you can't blame 200 million Americans. You have to blame Bush, Cheney, and Greenspan, Inc. I just feel, I just feel that, you know, people are hurting, and, and okay, go play some Kenny G music then. All right, I don't really, all right. We cannot afford to feel. We have a $14 trillion economy, almost a $40 trillion global economy. We have 6.2 billion people on the planet. Feeling does not work. Instead of saying, oh, I feel, how about you upgrade to know? Here's a free upgrade to know. It's called the Wealth of Nations. It's called the OECD database. Point out they can, if other people's lives are based on it, they can't feel, they must know. It's irresponsible otherwise. Changing reality, this is a particularly tricky one. You will see the majority of leftist tactics not go for a direct kill on data. You will see it questioning data. You will see it proposing new theories as to how things should be measured. And a perfect example is GDP is not a good measure of progress. In other words, our level of production in a, company, a country is not a good measure of progress. Profits of a corporation is not a good measure of progress. So they came out with what's called the genuine progress indicator. This was the, you know, amazingly, once Reagan gets elected, it goes down the toilet. Uh, but what they do is, is they say, hmm, we can't win in the real world, so we're going to change what's good. Well, wealth isn't good, low carbon emissions is. A fancy, powerful sports car is not good, a Prius is. Okay? In other words, they will always try to criminalize wealth. Well, you should, you're greedy. Greedy, oh, what do you need more than $800,000 for? Because that's $800,000 more I can stick in my ears and run around with. All right? <clears throat> the one question that defeats this is ask them, why do you always want more money then? Schools never get enough money, healthcare, education, never get enough money. Why do you always need money? 
If money is so bad, why is it they always ask for more? And then you'll see that it's nothing more than a hypocritical argument. Norway, oh, they love Norway. Norway, well, in Norway, they, 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 they um, have gold streets and diamond cars and the dogs sing symphonies and play the violin in Norway, okay? Norway is a very successful country, but it is also a socialist country, right? And they always point to that at, as long as well as Sweden and so forth. But here's the problem, two problems. One, we're already there. I'll talk about this statistic later, but we already spend as much of our GDP in government programs as Norway does. I also threw in the European average there to see that we're only 5% below the Norwegian average. We already spend as much as Norway. We're already a socialist nation. What more do you want? North Korea level, 100%, would that satisfy you? All right. Two, Norway is rich because of oil. If you take, this is Norway without oil, going back to 1971, and GDP per capita, the United States versus Norway. You take the oil out of it, they're roughly only 75%, 70% of our standards of living, okay? Now here's the ultimate irony. Oil's bad, right? And we're, we hate oil and the leftist philosophy, right? Oil's evil, but we cheer on Norway, but they get a quarter or a third of their standards of living from evil oil, hmm. Point that out to, the, well, wait, I thought oil was bad. Oh, but it's probably good because it's under a government corporation. In any case, there's your, if anyone, they'll, they'll bring up Norway and you point that out. Conspiracy theory, this is another little tactic that they'll have. You will present the data proving your point. They will claim it is bias. You will prove to them it is not. Therefore, it's not, oh, you've proved me wrong, I gotta rethink things. No, reality is wrong, ergo, conspiracy. Perfect example. I was talking to a buddy, I said, look, unemployment has decreased under the Bush tax cuts. The reason I said that is because it did. Unemployment went down after the dot-com crash, you know, stimulus thing came down. He says, where'd you get the data? I said, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Doesn't get any more official than that, folks. He says, well, it's biased because George Bush is president. Yes, because that's what George Bush was doing, is, is tainting Bureau of Labor Statistics data while he was fighting the war on terror, right. I said, well, okay, there's other, two other locations that are non-US sources, OECD and the International Labor Organization, neither of which are really right-wing bastions of hate and capitalism and other things. Guess what? The data was the exact same because they standardized their unemployment rates. Well, then there must be something wrong with this data. Ergo, it's a conspiracy. He didn't say conspiracy, but if all this data is wrong, the OECD, the BLS, the ILO, there are some pretty mighty powerful people in control of things that I'm not aware of, right? Well, conspiracy theory tells you is, is several things. One, it shows you how little they've thought through their ideology and their philosophy, let alone the actual data that they have. Two, shows how they will throw away data in exchange for adhering to their religion. Well, that's wrong. I'm gonna go back over here. It's, but, but it's not wrong. It's, it doesn't, you're not gonna get any better data. Oh, it must be reality, is, perception is reality. Then two, it shows you how desperate they are. If you have to resort to conspiracy explanations three or four times in an argument, you do not have a solid foundation or understanding of your ideology. You, you, you really shouldn't even be arguing it. Understand socialism has a monopoly on name calling when it comes to racism, bigotry, sexism, so forth and so on. And the reason why is that very brilliantly, they have captured different groups, ethnic groups, gender, gay, whatever, and basically have established the premise that if you are not for socialism, then you must be a racist, a sexist, a bigot, okay? I don't know how many, maybe this has happened to you, but when you argue, say, oh, I don't like Obama because of his policies, blah, blah, blah. A friend of mine, came, not a friend, but a, a, co, a, a colleague, I guess we'd say acquaintances. So why don't you like Obama? Is it because he's black? No, he's, he's a socialist. What is it? That has nothing to do. If it's not socialist, then you must be against women. Even or Lawrence Summers, perfect example. He said pretty much this, women should go into the sciences. That would help women immensely. It would close the gender gap or the wage gap, but he lost his job over it. So when it comes to this, capitalism is for everybody and the socialists know it. The best thing that could happen to the black community is that they all go major in computer engineering or something like that. They say, forget it with these social programs, we're gonna go and make money, stick it in our ears and run around. That's what it would be the best thing for them. But if they find that out, guess who loses a huge voting block? The socialists, not to mention all the programs that they generate through various affirmative action, outreach programs and so forth. 
Girlfriend said this, I don't care about your feelings, I care about you. That's arguably the best way to put this name calling thing. I don't care if you're insulted, I really care that you get a higher standard of living. And the way you're going now ain't gonna achieve that. Right? Okay, another tactic is yelling. And as I said before, it's childish and stupid, but so almost left us. Right? It basically is the most simple uh, strategy they have because they can't argue against you, they can't engage you. So they're gonna yell over you. This happens in protests where they yell you, you know, hey, hey, ho, ho, capitalism has gotta go. Uh, that was compelling, okay, you convinced me. But largely, if you see it like Tom Tancredo, he had to cancel a uh, presentation because some leftists on the North Carolina campus, I think it was, uh, got broke in, so forth and so on. Ann Coulter, I think, has had a couple pies thrown at her, a couple might have actually hit their mark. Uh, the larger point is that what this is, is nothing more than a violation of freedom of speech. This is Nazism, this is fascism, this is totalitarianism and oppression. Uh, I don't know of one instance where someone on a capitalist side of the political spectrum came in and shut down any political speech by a leftist. Uh, probably because we have lives, we have more important things to do, and we actually value the freedom of speech even if people disagree with us. Uh, but apparently, it, most of the violations, or all of them that I know, come from the left trying to shut down speech from the right. Then there's just plain denial. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, but I have like summarily defeated liberals. I'm sure you have. You've pointed out the data. You have proven them wrong time and time again. And you're wrong. No, I'm not defeated. I'm not done. Anyone have that happen with you? No? Yes? Okay. Again, delusional. Right? Key word today, delusional. They don't realize reality, that they're losing all their limbs and arms and the battle is over. Sometimes you just gotta know when to throw in the towel. You're not gonna convince these people. And the only thing that's really gonna convince them is when they get their reality, like they actually get national health care, they actually get socialism, they get whatever they want. They're like, oh wow, yeah, this really isn't great. This is, that, you're not going to convince them. So don't waste your time. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's gonna, you're gonna die soon and uh, you shouldn't waste your time. Now, measures that can be taken for us to engage and kind of debate, all right? One, understand you're dealing with an uninformed, ignorant child, all right? This is not like two equals going at it, all right? You are talking to someone who's less educated, less informed, probably even misinformed, uh, and it's gonna be more of a lecture teacher educating the student. And that's usually a very good way to engage, saying look, you're, in, you're misinformed, you, 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 you're missing something. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're trying and that's good and honorable that you're really trying, but you're misinformed. Let me explain to you. And that's where the vast majority of debates I've had, I have to deprogram them, say, okay, here's where you're wrong, here's the data to prove, where you're, here's the data to prove you're wrong, and then here's how it really works in the real world, okay? Uh, so try that, do not be intimidated though, that's the key thing, do not be intimidated. A lot of people, oh gosh, I, no, just, if, as long as you got the data, as long as you got truth on your side, you're gonna win, very simple. One topic at a time. Again, they love to change topics. Don't change topics. Because you'll forget that one, they'll move on to, they'll not solve that one, so forth and so on. If you can just get them on one topic, at least that shoots one hole into their philosophy. And now they gotta really start thinking about it, because it's not just each theory stands on its own, they're integrated. If you can prove them wrong on corporate taxes, they're gonna have to think about uh, personal taxes, they're gonna have to think about government spending, so forth and so on, okay? Pick your topics wisely. Choose them that are resolvable. It is pointless to try and debate abortion, legalization of drugs, or gay marriage. It's, a, it's an opinion, all right? Economics also is your largest problem facing the nation right now. Forget gay marriage, whether people are gay and they get married or not, that's really inconsequential to our future right now, okay? What you gotta do is focus on economics or things that can be proven with empirical data. Right? Uh, <clears throat> secondly, you gotta do it quickly. You got maybe five minutes to convince them. And with the internet, this has made things a lot better. You go online, find everything and anything, bam, like that. Right? So, and especially with internet being more available on the phones, coffee shops, wherever you name it, you should be able to find, hey, let's go on the computer and take a look and find it out. But you gotta be able to find that data quickly. Know your statistics, right? This comes with practice and more studying. Again, we don't wanna feel, we want to know. But more importantly, know where to find them, right? I have a lot of data and statistics. And what would happen, what would happen? Someone says, well, GDP growth goes up with government spending. I say, no, you're wrong. They say, really, how? What do I have to do now? 
I have to be go, I have to not only be able to go on the internet, I have to know exactly where I have to find that data. OECD, under the statistics section, economic projections. The faster you can go, the better you can be. Betting, this is a brilliant tactic. Understand there is no financial cost with being ignorant. You can have ignorant, dumb views all you want. It doesn't cost you anything. But if you bet a socialist, say, I bet you you're wrong, now you've attached a financial cost with them being ignorant. Now, what's going to happen is this. You will make the bet. They're going to balk. Well, I don't know. And you can go to them. Oh, come on. You think you know everything and, and you're not even willing to bet 20 bucks? Come on. You vote this way. You're not even, is your vote only worth 20 bucks if you can't, you know, come on. They'll take the bet. You're going to prove them wrong. They're going to resort conspiracy theory, tainted data, so forth and so on. So here's what you have to do. You have to structure your bet. One, you have to pick a provable topic that you know the answer to and can find the data quickly. All right? Don't bet, well, I, I think Cuba sucks. Well, that's not a structured bet. You got to, something specific. The income per capita is less than the Cayman Islands. That's what you got to do. Agree upon the bet and the data source. That's key. I say if we go to the Federal Reserve, the unemployment rate is 6% or higher. Okay, we go to the Federal Reserve. Agree upon the parameters. Otherwise, I'll say, you can't say high or low. They'll say, well, 10% isn't that high. Like in Tunisia, they have 30% unemployment. So, you know, the U.S. 10% unemployment. No, for the U.S., 10% unemployment is pretty high. All right? So you got to, because they'll try and wiggle out. I've done it before. They'll try and squirm the way out. You have got to lock them down, paint them in a quarter. And once you agree upon all the very precise, specific things that need to be done, you have them. Now, here's the other thing with betting you should go for the kill. And the reason why is it exposes how hypocritical and unfounded their ideology is. We are in a democracy or republic. The government is created by the people. Therefore, the people have a responsibility to the nation, a stewardship of democracy that we have to become educated, we have to become informed, so that when we vote, we vote in the right people. But if you're flowers and puppies and protests and let's do some pot and talk about acorn, you're not being a good steward. And if you cannot win the bet, a $100 bet, $20 bet, whatever it is, then your vote isn't worth that much. If you've lost the bet, your vote is worth less. Because obviously you're so uninformed, you shouldn't be in charge. You shouldn't be a steward of democracy. You're ignorant, you're uneducated. Right? And that you got to drive home. You should say verbatim. You shouldn't have the right to vote. And that's not being cruel. That's not being harsh. That's being reality. Because we can go back to those acorn girls. Do you want them in charge? No. All right? Otherwise, imagine the kind of policy that would be implemented. Free food and, and will pay for nationalized health care without taxing. All right, statistics are your best friend. This is where you ultimately are going to prove one economic system does better than the other. Statistics are the numerical reality of the economy. Right? It's one thing to have logic. It's one thing to have philosophy. It's one thing to have uh, uh, morality. It's another thing is whether it's actually true or not. And here is where you're going to prove it. One, here's government spending, federal government expenditures as a percentage of GDP. You see, here's World War I, a crisis. Here's World War II, a crisis. Here's Barack Obama going on a spending binge. Okay? This is the highest amount of federal government spending we've ever had uh, in the history of the United States that wasn't a time of war. Okay? So this gives you perspective when they say, we're just not spending enough. Guess what, people? We only can spend twice the amount that we're currently spending now. Ask a liberal, ask a leftist, well, how much more do you need? How much is enough? They'll say, oh, two or three times. Well, guess what? That's communism, 100% taxation rate. No one's going to work. All right, there are limited funds. Another one is total government spending. Understand this is federal government. Does not include state, local, county, sales, fishing, license, tax, all that. So you take total government spending as a percentage of GDP, not just national but local, and we're already at about a 43% rate. Now, the reason I bring up spending as a percentage of GDP is that this is the measure by which we determine whether or not we're socialist or not. Some people say you should take uh, revenue, but revenue that the, you only pay back what you borrow with more tax revenue. So you got you to tax in the future to pay for borrowed spending. In any case, the accurate measure of your overall tax rate is spending as a percent of GDP, because GDP is all we make. It's our total revenue divided by total spending. All right? <clears throat> so it gives you this overall tax rate. And the reason I bring this up is because we are socialists. 
right? The Democrats aren't Democrats. They are socialists. Proven. 46, I don't know what you'd call it, but a 43% tax rate? That's pretty socialist to me. Socialist President Barack Obama. Nancy Pelosi, the socialist. Not because it's a pejorative. Not because it's, you're trying to insult them. You're telling them because that's what they are. And that data there proves it. Okay, here. This data is a little bit dated. I know it's a little bit different, but I want to show you Canada, which we presume to be socialist, Norway, which we presume to be socialist, have the exact same, or roughly the exact same spending. And as you notice, we've gone up more to 41 with the projections, uh, but this is in a slightly older chart. The larger point splitting here is we already have the same level of spending as the socialist countries. We are socialist. Welcome to the United Soviet States of America. All right, the federal budget. Most of your arguments are gonna be on a national scale. You must know the federal budget. You'd be amazed how many people do not know what the federal budget is. Here it is, 21% Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, which one's this? Unemployment, welfare, interest, Department of Defense, global war on terror. Before the war on terror, defense was actually smaller than Social Security. Now, we can go through the details, but I simplified it here. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, interest, defense, health and human services, education, actual governing departments. 12% of the federal budget is actually spent on government. I mean, now defense as well, but actual governing of the nations. If you look at, though, the majority, you're gonna see that the vast majority, not the vast majority, but the majority of our federal budget is spent on income transfers. Welfare, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. You can throw health and human services and education in there if you want. Right? What this brings up the point, aside from the fact that you should know the federal budget, it also points out that the federal government is not primarily an institution of governance. It is first and foremost an institu uh, institution of wealth transfers. It transfers income. That's what it does. The reason why is that you can bribe these people to vote for you. If you just vote for me, I'll give you unicorns, puppies, flowers, chocolates, and Jennifer Aniston on rollerblades. Okay. Now, two items in the federal budget deserve additional attention, Social Security and Medicare. Here's their projected consumption of GDP going out into the future. Right now, both of them combined comp uh, take about 7% of our GDP. However, down the road, they're gonna consume something more like 17%. Social Security will actually level out, but Medicare is projected to grow up more so. That's the real crisis there. The point about this is that these two items will break the United States. They dwarf the current economic problems we have now with the housing crisis. This is what's going to enslave the nation. And right here, here's your enslavement. They're gonna raise overall tax rates by 9% GDP. So 9% of your additional, not the tax rate is gonna go up 0.09%. You're gonna pay an extra 9% of your salary, almost 10% to the federal government. So estimated in the future, you're looking at 57 to 60% of GDP will go to state and local, national, so forth, and governments. Is that socialist? Can we agree that that's socialist? We're rivaling Sweden now, okay? Sweden's cold. Another one, healthcare. They show, and then they're talking healthcare on this, so I thought I'd throw this chart in here. Here's how much we spend per person on healthcare. The United States spends the most per person, roughly about 6,000, or sorry, five, well, almost $6,000. The blue is the public expenditure, meaning government. The red is private expenditure. And they say we don't spend enough on health care or that we need a nationalized health care system. Guess what, people? We already do. Only Luxembourg and Norway spend more than us per person. All right? So if anyone, well, I just think we, the socialists will always go for two things, education and health care. We need to spend more money. <laughs> we do? 15% of our GDP goes to health care. We need to spend more? And given Obama's you know, pushing for nationalized health care, this will go up even more. The government needs to become more efficient is what it does if it should have a public expenditure on health care at all. Now, all this spending results in deficits. And again, we compare things to GDP because GDP obviously, you can't do nominal because you don't adjust for inflation or the size of the economy. Here's our deficits in World War I, deficits in World War II, deficits today, and we're not at war in you know, Afghanistan, but not a global scale. The reason I bring that up, aside from the fact that you should know it, so you can say, hey, look, we're, we're at a time of non-war, and we're spending more than we could possibly make, 
is here new debt per person by year. A huge demographic group of people voted for Barack Obama. I'll give you, you, you tell me if you can figure out, they voted for him because he was cool and he had pecs and, and he had really a cool wife. Who voted for him? Young people, because he was cool. It was the teen idol or American idol election that occurred. All right? Look at how much he just saddled you with debt. Every person in the United States got an extra $5,500 in debt added to them that one year, and another $5,000 here, and another $4,000 there. You just got enslaved by the guy you voted for because he has nice packs. Show this to youth. Show this to people. The soccer mom at the gas station two days ago, she had three kids in her car, an Obama sticker. It's like, wow, you voted for a guy to indebt your family upwards of about 40 grand, as far as my math can tell me. Good for you. Good to see you're thinking ahead and taking the time to look at the finances of the future that your children are going to live in. All right? Great chart to show people. Now, all this spending more than we make on the government level adds up to federal debt as a percent of GDP. And here, we're about, oh, where is it, 2009? We're about 50%. We're going to go up to 70%. Projected out even more into the future. Where are we? United States, 100% of GDP. In other words, if we all worked one year and we we're taxed at 100% and went to pay down the federal debt, it wouldn't be enough, about 105%. Okay, Japan's at 243%. Uh, regardless, when it comes to the debt, <coughs> with the federal debt, this shows you that there are finite resources. If we keep going and spending more money and more money, instead of actually paying down the debt, the United States government will go bankrupt. You can see this in a weakening of the US dollar. You can see this in the desire of China and Russia and other countries to create a new currency. Right? So when you want to say, hey, 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 this is, this is a great chart. This is the mounting cost of our sins for not being fiscally responsible. Now, that's the government. Americans, household debt as a percentage of GDP. So you find, 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 and we just accumulate a bunch of debt. Right? This is not government debt, this is the personal debt, housing, credit card, car loans, student loans, so forth and so on that we have. What this shows you, and the reason I bring this up, is it shows you the mentality of Americans today. The World War II generation, crazy foreign concept, they paid for what they wanted to consume. They worked up the money and then they paid for it. Today, we don't work, oh, work, it. oh, that's... I want to major in sociology and become a community activist and I'm going to borrow my money out of my house and spend my money and buy myself an SUV or a Prius or whatever people do. All right? This shows you the fiscal recklessness and idiocy of Americans. And you wonder why the government is having financial troubles? It's because Americans don't know anything about finance or personal responsibility. And they vote corresponding people into office. State budgets, all right? Again, it's, it's the exact same thing as federal budgets. If you want to argue state politics, you got to know your state budget. Here's the Minnesota state budget. Uh, different states have different quality. Like Minnesota's really good about putting their data up. California is horrible, absolutely horrible. But some very similar to the federal government. If only we spent more on healthcare and education. Healthcare, education, and then you throw in Workforce, intergovernmental aid, which all goes to various socialist programs. All right, 75%, uh, three quarters of your money is spent on social stuff. The actual governance of the state government maybe consumes 20% or 15% of the budget. Poverty rate. They say, oh, the number in poverty went up. This is great. This happened under Bush. And they said, oh, poverty has gone up 7 million people. Well, didn't the population go up too? You need to have a poverty rate. Liberals and leftists will always focus on nominal numbers. They will not focus on the rate. That's your poverty rate. That's what you want to look at. The problem is what constitutes poor? In Africa, poor is less than $2 a day. Here's what the poor people have in the United States. 42% own their own home. 73% own their own truck or car. Third of them have two vehicles. Air conditioner, refrigerator, clothes, dryer, disposal, microwave, color television. Two or more color televisions, 53%. Cable or satellite TV, 62. One third have large screen TVs. Are they poor by any stretch of the imagination on a global scale? No. All right, I'm tired about hearing about the poor. They're not poor. Let's set up a real extreme poverty rate so we can actually address the people that are poor and really do need the help. These people don't need help. 
Here's one of the best shots though ever, North Korea versus South Korea at night. This is where the 10 times the electric generation versus you know, North Korea comes in. But let's look at, let's change, change the goal. They're emitting a lot of carbon. Oh man, we should, we should really become more like North Korea. That's... All right, now here's some more literal, uh, if you ever run into someone who's an academic or whatever, here's your mathematical proof of the capitalism working. Now I've done it on many different years, but I didn't want to bore you with different charts. But here's your overall uh, tax rate versus a 15 year growth rate in terms of GDP. So this is our spending, per, uh, uh, spending as a percentage of GDP, and here's your 15 year average growth rate for all the OECD countries, which are the only countries that have enough economic data to do this. And if you look at it, the correlation is negative, minus 0.45, pretty statistically significant. All right? And what it tells you is that as your tax rates go up, your GDP growth rate goes down. This is logical, this makes sense, and this is the empirical proof. I did another one, your corporate tax rate, because corporations are evil. We don't want that icky, yucky employment and growth and prof profits are bad. And we certainly don't want our 401ks or IRAs or stock prices going, whoa, 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 come on. You're a Again, a negative correlation between the OECD countries. That did have a 10 year, 15 year, it became even less data points. But as your corporate tax rates go up, your GDP growth rate goes down long term. Final statistic on um, uh, capitalism and socialism. This is a genocide chart, it shows you the largest genocides throughout the past, I think, century. Yeah, century of death. The two largest ones, the Soviet Union and China. Okay? They accounted for the most deaths. Uh, I think, what was it, Russia was like 20 million, 30 million under China. Here's the track record of socialism. It, where Stalin tried to kill these number of people, does anyone know why you really die? What the major cause of death were in those cases? Starvation because the country couldn't produce enough food. Okay? When you kill the incentive to work, you kill the incentive to work and produce anything of value. Right? Here's global warming. This is what all the fuss is about. Ah! Oh! And I've lowered it here because it was 57 three days ago in July. Okay? So I'm going to take a wild guess and project it just a little bit down. Regardless, the overall trend of this is going up. And obviously it's because evil capitalists are emitting carbon and we must stop that. Well, here's the problem. And this is where I have my global warming philosophy based. This is the Vostok ice core data. They took a ice core out, they inferred temperatures and carbon from it going back 420 some thousand years. What we are getting all excited about and about to grind our economy down to a halt for is a temperature change within this uh, red area going from up and up and about the width of my fingernail in terms of time. If you look at the historical track record of the earth, is this little blip significant? This is a joke. This is what's called a scam. Again, changing reality. Uh, you can go here to this website and get all the different ice core data, but the Vostok ice core data I think is the longest one. So if you want like the longest example of data, this is it, all right? But we're going to change how the world fundamentally operates based on something about the size of a fingernail and about as wide on this chart. All right, regardless though, especially when it comes to global warming, you are arguing with fundamentalists. So don't expect any kind of sanity or rationalization or logic with them. Now, largest point, uh, overall point about these statistics, we cannot cover them all, but this is where you have to kind of take the ball and run. I've given you some, it certainly doesn't cover every topic, but it hopefully will give you an idea of, okay, these are the issues here, some main key ones about the tenets of capitalism versus socialism and so forth. What I would say is you must accept truth. You can't cherry pick. I see this happening on both sides, where people will exclude Norway because Norway has such high standards of living. Don't exclude Norway. Find out why Norway's rich. Oil, okay, that's the truth. You don't want to argue anything but the truth. You'll lose otherwise. Because someone's going to be better researched than you. There's always going to be someone better researched than you. Another thing you can do, you could go to Captain Capitalism, my blog, because I have five years of data. I've been doing this for five years now. I've compiled a lot of data, most of it's charts and so forth. If you go to the top of the website, you can see search blog, type in corporate tax rates, every post I made. Thank you for showing up. Just let me announce a couple things. One, AaronClary.com. Go there, you can see all the crazy stuff I do. Uh, not everything is politically related. Obviously fossils and dancing are not, but that is me. You can always come visit me. I have my daily write and tirade. 
on the uh, captivecapitalism.blogspot.com. That is the end. You guys are all free to go. Go on. What? No, that's all right. You're in the way of the camera, though. That's a, that's a, <laughs>